Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Um, today, we are going to talk about the book by Mary Daly, Pure Lust. And you can see on the title here, it's Pure Lust by Mary Daly, and it's being discussed by me, Joe Brew, Kate Graham, and Marie Long. Um, so welcome, everybody. And um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And um, so we've got Kate and Marie, who've both read the book and me. Um, uh, and so welcome, Kate and, and Marie. And um, I guess we all really love this book, but we're going to we're going to hand over to Marie first to do a short introduction to the book and Mary Daly. So over to you, Marie. OK, I just wanted to say a few words about Mary's uh, background because uh, I think it's important in, in understanding her work and her travails, really, in life. Um, she came from a middle class, uh, a working class Irish Catholic background in 1928. She was born in 1928. And so she was a child of the Depression, which really had a lasting effect on her in terms of uh, one of her major barriers was always money. Uh, so she had to get scholarships to, to do her vast education all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, she, um, she, her, her goal was to become a philosopher uh, right fairly early on. But, you know, she, not only was she a child of the Depression, but then there came, the war came along, uh, making life difficult, especially... Uh, and then the 50s, which was a very difficult time for women. And um, so getting in, just getting into school, in schools was very difficult. And it was just unheard of, apparently, at the time to become a philosopher. So what she did is she, become a, she became a theologian. And she has a, had numerous uh, degrees, uh, PhDs. And she, she jokes that uh, she's had sort of an accumulation syndrome. Um, and, 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 but she loved, she loved abstract thought. And, um, and she, she learned a lot regardless of where she went. Uh, and she didn't go through, you know, a straight path. She, she went quite circuitously um, to her goal, which she finally achieved. Uh, and, and that took her also to Europe in a place called Freiburg, uh, which she loved. Um, what else can I say? So she had to she had to constantly work all the time that she was going to school. Uh, and and she had to get scholarships. And she did. And so, you know, that that determined a lot of her <sighs> decisions. Uh, I think that's about all I want to say on her background. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, let's let's move on to Kate then. Um, Kate, why do you like Mary Daly? Like, why is she important to you? And and why do you like Pure Lust? And then you know, tell us a bit about oh, your well, your feeling. Um, or I mean, anything you want to. <laughs> oh, thanks, Joe. Thanks very much for organising this, and um, thanks, Marie, for that introduction. Then, um, yeah. Look. Um, it's not about liking her. It's it's about I see her as a guide, right? I think Mary Daly is a guide into feminist ethics, um, deep women-centered ethics and and vision. Um, and you know, I, I I we're so in need of that. Um, and so lacking in that really with quite a bit of analysis, but not um not enough vision. And um, because of her incredible sort of research her delving into the darkest uh, fathoms of, of male psychology and male supremacist ideology. She's gone in there and she's explored it and she's come back to us with, with a light and uh, she's capable of showing us a path um, which can avoid the insanity of, um, of simply uh, kind of God forbid, goddess forbid, you know, entering into a philosoph philosophy degree or, or or trying to follow these these nihilistic men 
on our own. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I found that, I mean, some of her ideas have completely transformed my life in a, it, it, it just changes everything. And I think the biggest one probably is her idea of metapatriarchal consciousness. <clears throat> but there are many, many other key ideas. But when I understood that, and she said that we are, if we are conscious of outside patriarchy um, and, and in sisterhood together, um, that's, that's essential for us sort of bursting through into living our true lives. And she calls it the self with big capital S. And when I really understood that, which I understood through reading Pure Lust, I suddenly um, felt like I was me. I could be <laughs> the person I wanted to be. And she'd shown me the way through to just tear off all this male imposed. I mean, there's so many good terms in there, aren't there? The, the, the plastic um, a femininity that she she says that we're forced to accept and to identify with, to think that we are those people. But yeah, I, I agree. I just think she's not just telling us what's happening in the world. She's say, saying, if you do, you can, we can do this. And it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I see her as a lifeline for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, whenever I think about modern times, uh, you know, and, and get to, you know, despairing, I go to Mary Daly and she she is. She's such an upper, you know, and uh, she really she shows us the big picture, um, you know, that and it, it's been this way since the beginning of patriarchy. And, and you know, there's so many tentacles. Um, you know, it's it's a hydra in terms of the way that uh, the tricksters uh, of patriarchy work. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, so I think it really helps us to to set it. Uh, what's happening today in terms of the uh, the gender identity crap, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in in perspective, that mm -hmm. this is really the latest uh, device mm -hmm. of, of the patriarchy. But it's just one more device because it's been happening from the get go. The dishonesty, the lies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can I read something? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. She's. Um, I love the way that she references other women. And uh, I've got a nice wee quote from Jan Raymond here. It is not enough for feminists to dissect the corpse of patriarchal pathologies. Women have not always been for men. We need to know the genealogy of women who did not and who do not exist for men or in pivotal relation to them. And we need to create a vision of the future of gyne affection. What women search for can be as important as what we find. You know what yeah, I mean? yeah. Mm. And related to that, she talks about the importance of women only space. Yeah. And in, in Pure Lust, sort of certainly towards the end of it, in the last couple of chapters, she's saying that men know that women only space mm -hmm. is essential yeah. to us, to our resistance. And yeah. that's why they attack it, which, yeah. again, is so important now yeah. um, that they know that if they can stop us bonding or, or having space to, to be together. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, I so, um, she, um, I think, um, I think it's probably important to read gynecology before you read this. <clears throat> or anybody uh, who's not read any Mary Daly before, I don't know what you, you two think, but I think gynecology has to be a starting point. And this follows on so amazingly from gynecology. Um, so in gynecology, she, you know, explores the fundamental um, nature of worldwide patriarchy and woman hating through male supremacy. And at the end of gynecology, towards the end of the book, she suggests a way for us to, as Joe said, to break free and to, to, um, to go forward. Yeah, in our elemental understanding. And in this, I think, um, just tell me to stop whenever you think it's appropriate, Joe, but I think she kind of introduces um, ethics and philosophy to women who may not have 
um, explored it at all before. And that's difficult. It's difficult to, you can't just kind of read, um, you know, in a flat, superficial way, uh, this kind of stuff. You really have to take time to explore what the words mean for you. And, and um, she exposes or describes, she takes us through how men and male supremacists have not only used these words, but they've limited our understanding of them and they've warped our perception of them to such an extent that we would be completely lost if we were to go into this realm um, un, un, unsupported and you know, not, not defended and without other hags and nags to, to help us. So, you know, it occurred to me uh, just this morning that a good example of that is this word mindfulness you know because a lot of a lot of what we're doing in when we're when we're exploring this is quite meditative we're we're dwelling and we're reflecting and we're thinking we're, we're going deep into into the meaning of stuff and sorry i've got a quote here from virginia wolf i love the fact that she references another woman and uh, yeah so and she says frequently the conditions for this realization seem to be absent and um, yeah um virginia wolf writes the past only comes back when the present runs so smoothly that it is like the sliding surface of a deep river. Then one sees through the surface to the depths. But to feel the present sliding over the depths of the past, peace is necessary. The present must be smooth, habitual. For this reason, that it destroys the fullness of life, any break like that of house moving causes me extreme distress it breaks it shallows it turns the depth into hard thin splinters and uh, you know she says many women can read this with a sense of bitterness and um, so you know she she's talking about our um sense of well i don't need to explain what she's talking about virginia wolf and mary daly can do it much better than me yeah but, then, but i mean you know, I, I like to this word mindfulness how crazy that uh, an experience which is so rooted in body scanning and so rooted in our bodies, right, would be described as mindfulness. Yeah, as, yeah. If, it, as if our mind is not in our bodies. You, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what Mary Daly says throughout this book is that the mind and the body are linked and that they are we are our bodies so she yeah. is exactly on message in terms of what we think now that you don't have this she she goes on often into normal male philosophy of this dualistic split of the spirit and the body being separate and this fragmentation and she links it up mm -hmm. to all the big famous philosophers like aristotle and Aquinas aquinas and plato mm -hmm. she's very confident and knowledgeable about what they are saying in terms of philosophy and and explains it to us and I would say in terms of reading it 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 does go into some pretty complicated areas and I've read the book at least three times probably four times and there are some areas where I think this is just too complicated for me to really deeply understand I would have to read a lot of Aristotle or Plato or really care and I'm just not going to so no. I, I would recommend anybody who's reading this the resections of the book that you might not feel you can really understand or have time to just leave them just go over them and carry on because yeah. mm. um it's uh don't let that stop you reading because it, there are some bits that are difficult and then you go into a really easy bit which is very plain English and I think that's a tip it's just don't worry if you don't really get all of it because <laughs> it's hard okay is she and she I wanted to say too along the lines of the body and the connection of the body and mind you know she calls women elemental mm. that's huge for her yeah uh, and that uh you know we're connected uh, to the water to the earth to the you know the the thunder the butterflies and birds and you know all of nature and that that is our reality um whereas patriarchy you know imposes on top of that a layer of, of phoniness of mm -hmm. of imitation plastic mm -hmm. um and and so 
you know, it's, it's really important to remember our connection uh, to reality. Yeah, yeah. I'll um I'll share the uh, the quote that I I got up about the first page. Um, let me get that up. So, um, if I could get it. So the book focuses on upon and spirals off. That's a word that she uses. The traditional. Oh, this is well, this is her writing. This is her. So that's great. So this is on page one. So it says this book focuses upon and spirals off the traditional deadly sin of lust. And you can see here that Mary Daly is using uh, capitals in a different way. And she's very creative with her use of words. And she says that the, the our creativity creating new words and using words differently has been taken away from us by the the patriarchs uh and she says you know let's just get on and do it um and she says so she says this deadly sin of lust which is treated here in an untraditional way phallic lust is seen as a fusion of obsession and aggression as obsession it specializes in genital fixation and fetishism causing broken consciousness, broken heartedness, broken connections among women and between women and the elements. Then she says, as aggression, it rapes, dismembers and kills women and all living things within its reach. Phallic lust begets phallo or makes begets phallocratic society, that is sado society, which is in fact pseudo society. So it's a plastic society or a made up, it's not real society. And then she reverses or she often double uses a word twice um and uses the the lusty so she uses the word lust with a capital l to be our um form of lust the lusty women who rage and roam through the realms of this book wield the labrises of our lustrous minds our double axes of divination and to defeat this obsession aggression now already there is so much in that that you would think if you were trying to 100% get all of that, you might just give up <laughs> because you won't read the book. But my recommendation is just go through it and then some of it falls into place. And the thing I totally love is she's so confident about what causes what. And, you, you know, my experience is she's right about what causes what. So i love i love her her vision and her guidance um so but i still find it a bit of a mystery you know the quote saying that this phallic um uh phallocratic society is driven by obsession and aggression it seems to make sense doesn't it but nobody else really manages to say it um a lot of it seems to be true well it is very true today as well so she talks a lot about men dressing up as women and um you know this is 1984 it's, it's just it's all there she she explains the whole of the the trans thing and as we mentioned a bit already that she's um she's very much in touch with janice raymond she quotes janice raymond many many times so i guess mm -hmm. they were very much in touch at that time. I think she was a student of, of Daly's, wasn't she? Yeah. Janice Raymond, yeah. 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 And they yeah. were friends. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the things she too, she says, you know, she says that patriarchy couldn't exist by acknowledge if, if it acknowledged reality. And so, you know, we, we see that. So I was, I don't know, recently I was thinking about the, uh, uh, the witch, uh, uh, the burning times. And, you know, I mean, in this, in all their justifications, you know, their pseudo justifications for uh, slaughtering women, for killing women, uh, primarily. And I mean, what, what kind of civilization can, could, you know, buy that crap? Um, you know, and, and and here we come to us, you know, and and people are buying this business of men thinking, actually thinking that men can become women. So you know, you, you know, you you you've really got to wonder about that. So it, it's really so they do exist 
um, a patriarchy that is exists on um, magical thinking, really, uh, and 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 that that's that's huge. Yeah, uh, and she, I mean, she talks a lot about the well it, at the beginning of the book. She says that the um, the myths that we have been taught about in patriarchal society the the core myth is the christian myth is the is and is the dogma of christianity and her thesis her idea is that um because western christianity the the cultures that sort of ran on western christianity have dominated have been imperialist and they've they've conquered they conquered the world in the last say 300 years that that is the core um, global myth that uh, is the dominant one and it affects everything she says and um she she sort of says you know it's just man-made it's, it, it's very poetically these these myths are man-made but they they control us but they also then predict what will happen in the future so not mm -hmm. only are they um made up by men to justify what men want to do now but they also um, by being there, they make the future happen, which is, you know, horrifying. Yeah. But it explains a lot to us. And yeah. Yeah. Can I uh, talk about um, um, something she calls pyromantic prudence? Um, you know, passionate py pyromantic prudence. And uh, yeah, and she 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 it's a good example. I think she breaks it down into um, various parts, and um, and she reinterprets these things for us, these aspects of it. Um, so, in the medieval tradition of theological ethics, prudence is said to have eight quasi-integral parts. That is, elements that are needed for a quote perfect act of the virtue of prudence. I don't really know what prudence is. You have to sort of think, what is prudence? Yeah. In order to read this stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, she's got memory, understanding, docility, shrewdness, reason, foresight, circumspection and caution. Now, this is according to male supremacy. And then she takes some. I'm just going to look at memory because that's what I'm kind of decided to focus on. And, you know, we've already had the quote from. Virginia Woolf about the, the, the stream, yeah, the river and memory. Anyway, traditionally, memory has been considered a necessary part of the virtue of prudence, since the practice of this virtue requires experience, and experience is the result of many memories. Patriarchal prudence is based on restored, mediated memories that reconstruct women's experience. Women breaking out of the vices of virile virtue. Oh, her alliteration is just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, She's yeah. Just wonderful. Yeah. She's great. Um, need to call upon and call forth the deep emotional memories of authentic individual and collective experiences. Experiences which are disregarded and erased by the preachers of patriarchal prudence. Okay. Developing the virgin virtue of prudence requires discovering the links among these memories, and reweaving women's own context of experiences. And then she goes on like that. Now you can describe that, she can describe that. But if you don't have any experience of that, how are you gonna be able to relate to what you're reading, right? And so, this whole book is really predicated, it seems to me, on our experience of each other, our sisterhood, our affection, our love, our physicality with each other and, and our trust. So in order to remember our experience, our early experiences of our mother, say, or um, in order to really delve into our experience of friendship and love and trust with each other, we need to be already quite, you know, heroic and, um, you know, kind of bold and fiery and so on. And, and so the book makes sense to those of us second waivers and those of us who are now de delving into what, femi what feminist, what women's consciousness could be 
what what possible revolutions of the world we can create and uh, she i think i mean i think she she talks about the um there's a taboo on us touching each other on yeah, women yeah. touching women and yeah. she says it's not just physical it's also spiritual or yeah. you know ourselves she quite yeah. often uses the word ourself yeah. <clears throat> to sort of as an analogy a bit with a, the spirit because she doesn't like this body spirit uh split she wants yeah. us to be a whole or mm -hmm. suggests that we are a whole and we we have integrity but um she says that there's uh a, ta a taboo under patriarchy on women touching other women mm -hmm. and that she so and she talks in detail about lesbianism and and is very you know says that that's the good <laughs> lesbians are good so she is very clear of um the the importance of lesbianism and that mm -hmm. being essentially great for us for us being able to touch each other both our bodies and our spirits mm -hmm. but um she also says we're the touchable cast and that we are a sex cast mm -hmm. and this is in 1984 and she has got a lot about um the situation of us being a sex cast and that mm -hmm. it is um a group that we cannot move out of which again is really important because mm -hmm. Now today, we're being women. Women are being given this illusion that we are part of a class that we can choose to leave to become men. Um, this illusion, this false promise of being part of a class, where she says, "No, we're not. We're part of a caste, the, the mm -hmm. touchable class. Caste, then we can be touched by all men, or mm -hmm. maybe if we're lucky, just by one or two men. But it's some some men can touch." Every woman is touchable. So that's, yeah, links up to what you've just said. Mm, thanks, Jo. I think I it's... I wonder if that has, has that changed. Do you think that's changed over time? You know, she um, she quotes uh, First Wave uh, a lot too. And and I really think that that's important for us to, uh, to understand our four sisters, uh, what she was saying about that. But, you know, it occurs to me that... Uh, my grandmother's generation, and we're talking late 1800s, mm. um, <laughs> you know, the, the women didn't have the problem then, you know, relating, touching one another. You, you would see women walking down the street, you know, holding hands wow. and with their arms around one another. And it wasn't, a, I don't, at least this is my impression, it wasn't so much an issue in those days, but somehow patriarchy and since that time has even has you know worked its its way it's paras it's a parasite a it's cancerous way you know into our psyches so that it, you know they've brought us you know away from one another mm -hmm. you know just in that short amount of time you know that hundred years or so um, you know yeah. they've done a lot of damage in that amount of time mm -hmm. can I, I let me quote. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, since I mentioned our four sisters, um, it, you know, it, they were, I, if anything, more radical than second wave, in my estimation. And I, you know, I really wanted to do a lot more research in terms of first wave. But what she said, it's better uh, far to suffer occasional insults or die outright than to live the life of a coward or never move without a protector. Yeah. Now that's that's in Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we're talking in mid 1800s. And this is uh, in the Mary Daly book, isn't it? She quotes her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I find that um, it's lovely reading Pure Lust and other stuff because you think of other things. To, she recommends other books to read. So then it yeah. leads you to a load of other women, doesn't it? It's like this. It's just chock full, chock yeah. full of quotations. Women and, and you know, and it's like the way she, with her incredible encyclopedic knowledge, really, and, and her, and, you know, her grasp of words, uh, the way she, you know, describes the the uh, the guys, uh, like from Aristotle on, you know, the old philosophers, the old theologians and stuff, 
Um, she does it, you know, just in such a, an incisive cutting way. Um, and she, she doesn't really swear very much, but her yeah. words alone just, the, I mean, her you know, wipe ability, them out. Her ability to eviscerate um, yes, our enemies is wonderful. I've got a quote here, you know, raging women, therefore, realizing elemental powers of reason. She's talking about reason as part of, um, of um, prudence here. Um, cannot tranquilly accept the bland and vacuous abstractions about good and evil that abound in the ethics of boredom. <laughs> Furies are too keenly aware of the realities of Christian gynocide and genocide to believe the dispassionate quasi-mathematical verbiage of patriarchal ethicists. <laughs> the detachment itself reeks of deception to those who have studied and can emotionally recall the history of four sisters burned as witches. Those whose race has been labeled, maimed, killed, and dismembered as evil cannot be dispassionate about evil. Moreover, yeah. the particulars about which racy women reason, the everyday details of women's lives are charged with the burden of the stigma inflicted upon the female sex by the patriarchs and blah, blah, blah. She goes, I mean, you know, she goes on. I mean, it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. She seriously hexes, hex, hex, hex. She hexes all of them, you know? <laughs> and yes, um, I think it's important to get into the spirit of that yeah. and um, to, you know, it calls us to be incredibly courageous as Elizabeth Cady Stanton did there and, um, and to be rebellious and to be furious and to be elemental and yeah. Absolutely. Not to be nice and kind, and you know, not to be polite and well-mannered and contained and pacified and domesticated and, you know, stuff that. Yeah, definitely a call to rebellion. Um, I'll, I'll show another um, uh, slide that's. I'm just oh, sorry, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to need to. We've got a few slides, but this. Mm. Um, Okay, give me a moment to read it, please. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> this is this is one that is about the Christian um, thing. It's it, she writes here on page fifty-one, talking about the doctrine of transubstantiation, uh, which she thinks is very important. She says, according to which the substances of bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ. Daily writes the swallowing of this dogma, the denial of one's own sense and senses prepares the way for acceptance of further deceptions yeah. this is especially the case because of the brazenness of the deception yeah. she calls this and others the biggest lies and they create father fostered false con consciousness and that really um you know so she's she's saying that in christianity they brought in she tells the story of the idea of transubstantiation which only really came in uh, in the 20th century, mid 20th century, and it further uh, sort of befuddled and confused people about the difference between ideas and body and it created uh, confusion and the lie um, that you can move from ideas into body and back again or, mm. you know, and it's... Um, it's part of that she says the denial of one's own sense and senses and then that prepares the way for further deceptions um she talks about uh george orwell's book 1984 quite a lot um mm. about that thing that leaders in 1984 big brother wanted us to deny the reality of our own senses mm. and daily brings that back and says so you know these myths and this truth that is, or false truth that they're trying to force upon us are fundamentally uh, sort of evil um, and big lies and we need to reject them. And mm -hmm. it's it, she does it in a very beautiful way, but it also anybody who's been brought up Christian or influenced by Christianity is mm -hmm. very, very helpful. She's, she's so clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She talks about the second coming of witch of the witch craze, and uh, what she says about that 
she says it's training women to do it to each other, uh, mm -hmm. screw each other, in other words, mm -hmm. uh, and, and pseudo-feminism, which is really important for us to keep in mind because it just seems like, you know, there's so many, uh, there's so many conflicts among us. And, but, you know, I, I really think she's such a guide, you know, I mean, it, it's one of the reasons I think we need to, you know, really stick to, um, stick to, stick to the basic theory, um, you know, of, of reality, of, of the destruction of words, uh, to, to look at the big picture, uh, so that we don't, um, we don't get lost. She says that, um, you know, we can easily be distracted by one issue or another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and she says that, you know, it's okay to focus. Uh, but the thing is that it's really important to realize that all these issues are connected. There's a thread among them. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, then, then we can, we can sort of stay our course if we remember that because mm -hmm. very easy to get lost in one or, or totally depressed mm -hmm. and, and, and burned out for that matter, mm -hmm. you know, concentrating on one, one issue or another, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not the end of the, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's that, and, and she talks a lot about talking, you know, taking care of oneself, how crucial it is. Um, to take care of ourselves and also to be, you know, at the same time connected with one another. Mm. Um, I think that's really crucially important. What you said there, really, really important. And what it brought to mind, to, unfortunately, was that you know, is the the fact that for many women, they they do lose their way. I mean, you know, look, yeah. um, some Catherine McKinnon, for instance. How depressing yeah. is is that? That Catherine McKinnon, after a lifetime's work. Uh, defending women's rights and understanding and fighting for uh, the defense, uh, you know, a rape is a war crime and 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 defending women being prostituted and, and pornographied and stuff uh, that she, uh, you know, has completely lost track of, of this um, trans issue and it seems to think that women, um, these men can, can successfully call themselves women. I mean, it's just astonishing. If we don't see the the interconnectedness of it all, if we can't see through the veil of patriarchal, um, you know, obscurity, if we can't find a way to to see it in its entirety and kind of, yeah, we're 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 just running around in circles, really, aren't we? I don't know what we're doing, but we're not we're not on the right path to to uh, women's liberation and. Um, I'm going to um, share one of the quotes that this is one that you came up with. Oh, I failed to share it. Sorry, everyone. Um, that you came up with, Marie. Um, oh, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> so, right. Badly. But there's a, I'll, I'll get the quote up and then we can um, uh, look at it. But it's saying it, what she's saying is that um, that uh, phallocracy or the the um, yeah. patriarchy is the core of the problems that we're facing and so in fact i'm just not going to bother trying to share this i'll just i'll just explain it and then maybe hand back over to uh, marie but what um what she says is that the the root of a lot of the other uh, forms of oppression is uh the oppression of women by men and yeah. phallocracy and now that's a thesis that she has and many radical feminists that sort of seems to be one of the central beliefs of radical feminism she and i wanted to link that up to she is very clear that she is a ra radical feminist so yeah. she uh so in terms of us understanding where this series is called radical feminist perspectives yeah. um she in 1984 uh, is saying this is radical feminism in her view, and so I think that's that's helpful um, uh, for that. I'm just yeah, gone. And you know, too, um, this business of reinventing the wheel. Uh, mm. I don't know if she she talks about that in the book. I, I can't remember, but it sort of comes to mind. And, and when I think about um, 
you know, the, we, we really should have learned if we were on our toes at all, um, that from, from, uh, from our four sisters, because, you know, there was division there, if you remember about, you know, uh, there, we, I'm talking about America right now, the suffragists, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was this division between, um, those who believed in putting everything into the, uh, no, the voting <laughs> suffragettes uh, into voting, mm -hmm. and and then there were uh, there were the others, and that's basically the uh, 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 Elizabeth uh, State, uh, Katie Stanton group, uh, were really uh, wanted to make it much more broad, and and felt that the whole system sucked. Uh, that it needed to be it needed to be changed, and and and, and that's still an issue today, uh, very much, um, as far as how systemic this thing is, as opposed to, you know, this and that and fighting here and there. And uh, I mean, and yeah, we all, we all have our the, different the, paths into women's rights activism, if you like, and our consciousness. We could, some of us come in like I did through lesbianism. Some of us come in through resisting the pornography or prostitution. Some of us come in through direct other direct experience of male violence. Some of us come in through trade union movement and the demand for equal rights and so on and so forth. And as radical feminists, we have to be at the hub of all these different um, attributes of structural oppression of women, right? Um, but it's still possible to be at the hub and think that, you know, radical feminism is just about fighting on all these different fronts, you know, that it's about responding and reacting and resisting yeah. and violence. And what Mary Daly does is she really puts down roots, like so many lesbian poets and, and writers and singers and, you know, um, yeah. and like so many um, spiritual um, um, explorers have done as well. She puts down roots and says this thing, you know, we need an ethical base, we need a philosophical base, we need to find, and she just discovers it she she you know there it is in our memories in our experience in our bodies in our senses you know in our elemental being there yes, is yeah. our experience of the world and when we when we see that of course or, or experience when we when we remember that we have yeah. the, the, a whole other level of you know empowerment and um and you know creativity and possibility for what this world could be like you know and and we need that we need we need mary daly we need absolutely mary. we do and she, but and one of the things too we i think we haven't mentioned is, is her you know her, her advice is to live on the boundaries yeah oh uh, yeah know? and and <clears throat> but she she adds to that that we must be aware of everything that's happening. Yeah, uh, I think she she's definitely in favor of separatism. Yeah, but that but with a knowledge of everything that's going on too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. She talks a lot about separatism, doesn't she? That's sort of really in favor of it, and and in um, on many different levels of our and and th and then says that that's where we get lots of joy from. Mm. I've just managed to get up this a different quote, but it's saying women who have been thingified, deprived <laughs> of conscious participation in being, have trouble believing in the sanctity of women's insides, both their own and those of other women. This mm. doubt expense, extends to the spirit, personality or self. And this leads on in in her book to the discussion of male identification and horizontal violence. Now, there's a lot in this. And there's, as we know, there's a lot in the book. She says that part of what men do or maybe a central part is they make us into things. Mm -hmm. So what they want to do is they want to create plastic women who mm -hmm. are objects. So that's that object objectification. And. We sometimes, women, uh, sort of become thingified. We we see ourselves, I mean, not us, but uh, it, because I think we've gone too far down radical feminism to believe we're things. But it's 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 a, a, a duty of in the patriarchy to thingify women and make make women into objects. And so you're not really truly being. And she she splits the word being as well to say 
it's a verb it's not a it, it, she wants to make it really clear that our being is a process mm -hmm. and the process of our living and she she I mean it's so poetic she'll saying our unfolding and our linkages and our spiraling mm -hmm. is our our uh, so we're not a being as one word we are a process and that's so fantastic to to sort of when you really get that and the more you read it the more you get that it, it our process is the thing and our spiraling and whirling is um is the sort of the reality and its participation in the world it is so beautiful and then yes. what's really great is she says then um if you allow yourself or you have been thingified you become you you don't you don't believe in yourself as a process and as a creative thing that's or a person that's doing things um you you end up identifying with men so you'll often take the sides of men and then you do this horizontal violence now that's really yes. complicated what she talks about in yes. horizontal violence but um her her idea is that the reason that women who've started to join feminism sometimes then attack other women, other feminists, is they have over large expectations of, of other feminists, but they also are still to a large extent male identified and it's easier to attack other women. But she, she explains it better, but I, I don't think we've got time to go into that. But that's definitely a section that if you want to know more about horizontal violence that's violence by our sisters in, in feminism against each other she i think her explanation is wonderful and, and she she calls women yeah she calls women out uh yeah uh, just as much as men and you know what i said about the second coming of the witch craze it's women you know uh hurting other women uh, you know, deciding to align uh, with the patriarchy, which is, you know, and for, and for safety uh, kind of thing, but uh, in, in a, and out of fear, um, which is sad. There's a couple of questions in the chat, and one of them I think we could we could definitely uh, talk about. There's uh, this is from Maria Rowe. It says, how hard was it for her to publish? This is Mary Daly to publish those revolutionary ideas. What was the academic reaction and what would be the reaction if she were allowed to publish it as a scientific paper today? So I guess we've all got some answers to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure, you know, how much her trouble she actually had publishing, but I'll tell you, she had a hell of a time teaching and getting her degrees. And that was another of her barriers besides being poor. Um, the, the discrimination that she faced was tremendous. Um, you know, we're talking the fifties is when she was, you know, getting educated type of thing, which is which one of the things that I admire so much about her is, okay, so she, you know, she had, she had one block after another and she went around them, you know, and she went this way and that way in different country, wherever she was so driven um, that uh, I, I, I find her so remarkable in that, in, in that respect. And so her, you know, and her knowledge was so, it was not only deep in her own subjects, and she was a theologian and a philosopher, but it was broad. She also had a master's degree in, uh, in English. So, you know, she re she refers in, in the book in, in, in many, many writers kind of thing. Um, yeah, she was, a, she was a canny woman, wasn't she? I mean, oh. in the, the book that she wrote, I think it was just the, the one just before gynecology it was called Beyond God the Father. Mm. And in order to write that book, she got she got funded to write that by the Catholic Church, which I think is just epic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she got them to give her a year sabbatical, right, to go yeah. off and research this book and then wrote this, you know, revolutionary book. Even if it was the only thing she ever wrote, wrote it would be fabulous, right? Um, so she was a crafty, you know, but a crafty hag who... Um, she you know, was she, very she crafty. Her way around, I, she knew her I way around it. patriarchy. But, she knew what they it, were up to and how but, to... But, you know, she has plenty to say about the priests. Yeah, but and, 
and and <laughs> and of course she knew them intimately but mm -hmm. they were talking about you know getting along you know they were constantly blocking her because of course she she stood for everything that was uh you know uh, anathema to them yeah 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 and uh <laughs> You know, you can imagine when she walked into a room of priests, they were wetting their pants. Ah, well. Yeah. She, um, I mean, this links back also to, in my mind, to the boundary living thing she suggested. So when um, she worked in, in the college in Boston, didn't she? The, the yeah. religious college and uh, as an academic and she taught this, this. And so, and her courses were really, really popular. And yes. then what, they men wanted to get into the courses and she yes. did a compromise where she said that men could go into the beginners course the entry level and then the advanced courses were for women only now there's a massive fight about that and she had huge support in the women's movement and actually from men, some men as well and the basically the they tried to get her fired but she got she was very supported and she wouldn't leave so she managed to cling on very, very for a very very long time in academia teaching as an academic um and she but she also she explained this idea that she feels is the answer is to do boundary living which i think marie talked about where you have one foot in the radical feminist women's separatist lesbian mm. movement mm which is and with our elemental being with the trees and the plants and the animals um and we have one foot so you can do this and she felt it was a useful thing to do because she had this huge uh ability to to sort of reach a lot of people but also to to learn and to take ideas from the patriarchy mm. um and so have one foot in the establishment in a normal everyday job but both mm. of those places so it's not just be a separatist and not just be in uh the patriarchy to do boundary living which i think works for me i think i would agree that that is is definitely a good way i think you know i don't see how you can survive just being in the patriarchy being because you you'd just die really wouldn't you it'd be horrific but just being a separatist i think is possible but and some women do it but she chose this boundary living and mm. held on very strongly. I think there's some misunderstanding too, though, about her being as a, as a teacher, because I understand that um, she enjoyed teaching the boys as well as the girls. Oh, yeah. In college. Yeah. Uh, and it was only later, I think, <clears throat> that this became an issue and it was becoming an issue in society. Uh, that it, it, but but she was constantly she was willing to make compromises. She had suggested at one point, you know, I'll t uh, you know let me I, you know I want to teach the girls. I'll also teach a boys' class, you know. But it was this constant, uh, you know, back and forth and, and prevent. I don't know if she ever did get her full professorship or not, but they certainly blocked it for years. Mm. Can I? Um, we've got. A good five minutes left. Can I talk about something towards the end of the book where she talks about breakthrough to metamorph metamorphospheres? Do you mind? Um, she talks about three things. I think it's quite important because um, we mentioned the horizontal hostility and stuff. And she she teaches us how to be. It, she doesn't just dump all this stuff on us and say, you know, go out and be a wild hag. You know, she really kind of unfolds a path for us and says look you know come on follow me you know and um, be do this and um so she's she talks about be be longing be friending and be witching i just want to talk about the belonging here it says um the boxes of inauthentic belonging um in order to comprehend how alienating and how potted the desire to belong can be it helps to recall some meanings of belong. These include, quote, to be suitable, appropriate, or advantageous, quote, to be proper, rightful, or fitting place, situation, to be the property of a person or thing. Belong also means to become attached or bound. It means to be properly classified. She says, um, she's got quails belong among the mammals and then she says needless to say whales themselves probably are not interested in this classification 
<laughs> oh god she's got a wonderful sense of humor isn't she and yes, she does. Says that she does. The potted passion of desire shrinks the longings of women to such a point that women actually long to belong in the sense defined above. Right. Patriarchal women long to be appropriate, to be in a proper, rightful or fitting place and to be the property of a person or thing. For example, in the institution of marriage. And, uh, you know, when she says that, I think about lesbian marriage as well. I mean, there are legal you know advantages definitely in terms of all sorts of issues to, to be for us to be married and to have access to each other's care in our old age and so on and so forth but i hate it when i hear lesbians talking about my wife you know and this kind of shit i mean you know who needs that shit as if we don't know where that crap comes from sorry it's not about me is it it's about mary daly so <laughs> you know it's like, you know, she, she talks about that and she says all these mirror images are invitations for women to sacrifice our autonomous wild selves for the sake of protection by the paternal protection racketeers, right? The protection racket requires a trade-off, the abandonment of belonging in return for apparent shelter and safety. Right. I'm I'm going to keep on now and add a different thing. That's the thing I love about every time I read Mary Daly is that this idea she comes up with this idea. As far as I know, she came up with the idea of sparking. Yeah. And there's lots of other great things she says. But she says mm -hmm. that when you're reading another sister's writing or, you know, we're together, often we spark each other um, mm -hmm. and ideas come up our own creative ideas come up and that's a, just a total joy that um it, she really sparks off lots and lots of stuff in me and moves me either theoretically or in you know in my how i feel about things and that's just um a total joy so you you can um it's a process and she says that in one of her books she says I don't want to fix this book. I want this book to be alive. Like already it will be, it will be different. Um, things will have changed. Hopefully you'll just use this as a sort of a board to leap off um, uh, into, into other things. So she's, she's really sort of saying this book shouldn't be a, a static thing. It should, yeah. we should see it as part of the process that once I wrote this and then, you know, um, and also another thing I totally love, it's like spending time with a completely wonderful person. I feel like she's with me and, you know, loads of Virginia Woolf. She's introduced me to loads of women she knows about. But once you've once you've read her, she's there with you mm -hmm. as lots of other fantastic radical feminists. And it means that moving away from patriarchy isn't so lonely oh and that's what i wanted to say as well she deals with being alone very very well because clearly she yes, had been yes. isolated she says especially or temporarily sometimes from our sisters and she says we need to have the courage to be alone sometimes radically alone doesn't she yeah. and it's nice that she shares that because obviously well not obviously but many of us at times feel very alone yeah. um you know I don't at the moment very much, but I have done in the past. And she <laughs> she deals with that in mm. in a really clear way. And and it's very encouraging. Mm. Mm. Okay, we've just got one minute left. So maybe you two yeah. <clears throat> say the last thing. Well, uh, yeah, again, I, I'll, I'll say one thing. It's a little bit off the of what we were just saying. And it, it, it's not very, well, she thought and said that the United States is rotten to the core. And that's quite quite a statement to make, you know. So, um, someone had asked for someone from the chat had asked about uh, how she was received. <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah. Okay. And uh, over to you, Kate, for the final point. Oh goodness me. Uh, well, um, it's ongoing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, Obviously, you know, the, the whole imperialism, I mean, good God, we're in Britain. Don't talk to us about rotten to the core. We, we, we've been there. We're well, we're, we're all marinated and festered. And, yeah. 
But um, yeah, it's been great. Listen, thank you very much. Thank you, Marion, for all your work. I understand we had a bad troll at one point in the chat. Thank you, everybody who's contributed in the chat. Thank you so much, Marie. It's lovely to meet you um, for the first time here. I hope we'll go on and, and have further conversations. And thank you, Joe, for your for your dedication and determinedness. And um, yeah, my rage, as Mary Taylor would say. Making this all possible. <laughs> in so many yes, ways. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. My focused rage. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We, uh, You can see that we absolutely love Mary Daly and recommend you read it. There's loads more in there. So we, we, um, we hopefully we'll be able to come back to either other of her books or or this again, because there's so much or other other women talking about this book. Um, great. And maybe see you in the breakout rooms or see you next week or something like that. OK, bye, everybody. Bye.